Please welcome your panelists for the future of health, moderated by Executive Director of Faster Cures, Tanisha Carino. Good morning. Welcome to the 2018 Milken Institute Global Conference. I'm Tanisha Carino, and I'm the new Executive Director of Faster Cures. Faster Cures is a center of the Milken Institute, and our name is our mission. I came on board just this past January, and I'm delighted to lead Faster Cures to take on the next set of challenges that slow medical research. For all of us, the idea of the future of health has the ring of optimism and promise, whether it's what we need to find the next cure or treatment, or how we can all collectively engage to improve health around the world. My first hands-on experience in working in health was during my undergraduate years at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. To fulfill the requirements of my major in sociology, I interned at Aid Atlanta at the very beginning of the AID epidemic. It was here that I witnessed firsthand the desperation for a cure and the reality that our laws and regulations at that time kept our clients from feeling secure in their housing, employment, and the ability to live with dignity. So let's fast forward to today. Someone diagnosed with HIV, if provided access to and maintained on antiretroviral therapies, has the potential to live a life as long as someone without the disease. This outcome could have only been achieved through the activism of the patient community and the efforts of all parts of society. HIV has not been cured, but it represents a beacon of hope for how we in medical research, public health, and the collective action can lead to faster cures. At the Milken Institute, we seek actionable solutions to persistent global challenges that require bold leadership and collaboration, and I know that is why each one of you are in this room today. The Institute's work is guided by a formula Mike created in the 1960s, that prosperity equals the effect of financial technologies acting to multiply the total value of human capital, social capital, and real assets. And this is why the Milken Institute works across the spectrum of health, through our work in the Linda and Stuart Resnick Center for Public Health, the Center for Strategic Philanthropy, the Center for the Future of Aging, and Faster Cures. Together, we are tackling questions such as how can we speed the development of cures? How do we democratize the miracles of science and implement evidence-based practices to improve public health? What do countries need to do to capture the value of healthy aging in the population? And how do we leverage philanthropic capital to fuel medical innovation? The theme of Global Conference, Navigating a World in Transition, aptly describes the state of health and medical innovation. Today, the most precious commodity in the 21st century is data. Data combined with advanced analytics holds the promise to improve health of more and more people and to do it faster. Throughout the next few days, I encourage all of you to participate in our health-related panels. Directly after the session, you can check out Preserving the Promise of Cancer Immunotherapy, and later today, you can participate in panels on global health, all has Alzheimer's disease, food security, the opioid crisis, mental health, and artificial intelligence in medicine. And that's just the first day. This session is such a treat. Today, we have leaders from across the sectors of the non-governmental organizations, government, philanthropy, that are playing a role in investing in human capital, improving health, and, su and supporting global prosperity. The panel will be split into two discussions. And for the first discussion, we're about to invite Dr. Frances Collins and Congresswoman Diana DeGette to reflect on where we are in biomedical research and what the future holds for us. The second part of our session will be focused on the role of human capital and the prominence it, it plays in driving economic prosperity. Now, as our panelists come to join us, I would like to start with a quiz. And so for veterans of Global Conference, you're not allowed to share the answer. So the question is, in economic terms, as much as what percentage of all economic growth can be traced to advances in health? So I'll let you ponder that while I invite our two panelists up to the stage.
great. Okay, so in a show of hands, who believes that the answer is 10%? No takers, 10%. How about 20%? Maybe it's a little too early for folks. No 20%? How many of you have been to Global Conference? I think this might be the case. 50%. Show of hands. Nobody look at Mike. 90%. <laughs> All right, brave souls. Francis, what do you think? I think it's 50%. You think so? Yeah. What about you? Because Mike I, said so. I always try to agree with Francis <laughs> and Mike. <laughs> I think that we should have gone, we should have taken Mike out of the session so that we can actually do the quiz. So for those of you who answered 50%, you're absolutely right. So in economic terms, over the past two centuries, as much as 50% of all economic growth can be traced to advances in health hmm. and investment in, in medical research and public health is what's driving that. So I would like to first start with the tremendous success that the two of you achieved in passing 21st Century Cures almost 18 months ago today. 21st Century Cures was a recommitment in our country in terms of the role of biomedical innovation and the recognition that we could do more and do it faster. 21st Century Cures has offered substantial funding to the National Institutes of Health, it has been able to cut through the red tape that Francis, you and your researchers found yourselves working in. Mm -hmm. It supported new and innovative ways of data sh sharing, including a requirement that the National Institutes of Health, uh, the research be shared if it's supported by your organization. And you began to really reconnect in terms of what is the workforce that we need in order to fuel biomedical advances in the future. So we all are taking this victory lap and saying this is amazing and we are there and we are now progressing in terms of all the the goals that we set out in cures but what's next francis let's begin with you tell us where we are well again i just want to say what an incredible shot in the arm the 21st century cures bill has been for all of us involved in biomedical research and an incredible effort uh, spearheaded uh, by diana de and fred upton in the house and by Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray in the Senate, and with phenomenal bipartisan support. Uh, we are in a much better position to be able to move forward some very ambitious programs, including additional funds over a 10-year period that have been provided for the Brain Initiative, for cancer uh, through the Cancer Moonshot, through Precision Medicine, and something called All of Us that I want to say a little bit about here in a minute, as well as Regenerative Medicine. And to have that kind of longer-term support as opposed to what is generally the case where from one year to the next, you're not quite sure whether you have stability or not, has been enormously encouraging. On top of that, the regular appropriations process has made it possible in the last three years for us to turn a corner from what had been a steady loss in purchasing power. So we are, I think, in a very good position to go boldly forward. One of the things that the 21st Century Cures Act focused on, which is intensely important, is early stage investigators, to be sure that we are giving those folks who are just starting down their career path an opportunity uh, to take risks, uh, to send us their best and brightest ideas, even if they might even seem a little wacky, but if they work, they're going to make things really different. We want to be sure that that's out there as a possibility for that next generation. And with the resources and with some additional things we're doing to make sure that funds are available in an unprecedented way for those first-time applicants, we're optimistic that we can turn around what has been a pretty tough period since 2003, where a lot of momentum for young investigators was beginning to get squeezed. Thanks, Dr. Collins. Congressman DeGette, you've been in Congress since 1997. You've been one of our strongest advocates for health, whether it's on affordable coverage or biomedical research. Tell us, do we still have bipartisan support for medical research? Oh, uh, Tanisha, this is one of the bright shining stars, I think, with, with um, Congress. We have a, a really solid bipartisan commitment. As Dr. Collins said, when Fred and I started working on the bill, we spent three years and what we were trying to do was figure out what we needed to do to take biomedical research and then device and, and drug approval at the FDA into the 21st century. It was, a, it was a, a really extraordinary bipartisan effort. We even had, I visited Fred Upton's district and he came to Colorado 
And so it was great. It was, it was a, a piece of legislation we were very proud of, as you heard from Dr. Collins, lots and lots of um, changes in the way we do research, but also the funding that we needed. But what's really extraordinary is we then went beyond CURES. In CURES, we had $2 billion in guaranteed funding for that five-year period. But then we went beyond that, and the budget this year, with all of the partisan drama that we see in Washington right now, we actually appropriated $3 billion, a $1 billion more than anybody thought this year. And that's really good news. But you know, to your original question, there still is a long way we have to go. Uh, one thing that we've been talking about is, and Francis is going to talk about his exciting new precision medicine initiative, but we need to find better ways um, on a national level to make that data more interoperable and to really try to work with how we use the data, the patient data that we get from those studies. And another area uh, that Congress is working on right now that I hope we can pass in a bipartisan way is a real solid, um, in-depth dealing with the opioid crisis in this country right now. And related to that is our commitment to true parity in mental health. Uh, so, so that we have, um, you know, I always like to say, disease doesn't just affect Republicans or Democrats. It affects every family in this country. And so that's why I think we've had good bipartisan support. But we need to take that goodwill that we had with Cures, and then we need to, to continue to move forward. Mm -hmm. Congressman, yeah, we're going to talk about opioids in just a minute. But I want to reflect on your comment about data. So outside observers to our country and those that live in other countries view our fragmentation in terms of where our data lives as an area that is really holding us back. And that if there was more consistency in how we collect data, that it would actually create different markets for how we drive analytics and really improve care. Francis, how do you feel about that? Where does all of us fit in? And where can we go to really capture the value of the data that we're collecting as a country and, and drive medical research? Well, it's both a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is that most individuals, most hospitals, most doctor's offices are incorporating medical records as electronic, and that is something we didn't have 15 or 20 years ago. The bad news is it's very clunky, and a lot of these are not interoperable and difficult to work with. If I go to slide 43, Basically, this is one of the reasons, though, that we think the time is right to tackle something that would not have been practical even a few years ago, which is to put together a longitudinal cohort study. Think about Framingham, except multiply it by about 40 in terms of the number of individuals involved, and apply it to all illnesses, not just cardiovascular disease. Use the interest in patient partnerships, which the public is increasingly wanting to take part in, not as subjects, but as participants, as partners. Use the electronic health records, which you can glean useful information out of. Diagnoses, laboratory tests, medication lists, and so on. Take advantage of wearable sensors, like I'm wearing an Apple Watch and a Fitbit today, and I bet a lot of you are wearing these things as well. Ask people to provide that kind of information about what's happening to them on an hourly basis. And the tools of genomics, which now, some 15 years after the completion of the Human Genome Project, have become remarkably affordable, with a whole genome sequence now costing less than $1,000, which is amazing to be able to say. All of this folding into an opportunity in big data. So if you go to slide 41, what we are preparing to announce very soon, I mean very soon, is the launch of an unprecedented United States national program to try to understand what are the factors that involve health and illness. And we're going to invite one million people to take part in this enterprise, to be consented, to provide the kind of data I just mentioned, and then make that available to researchers who have qualified ideas about what we could learn from that. Now, this sounds pretty ambitious. It is. We've actually been engaged in a beta test of all of us with more than 100 collection sites for people to sign up over the last year. Every one of those has now been brought on board in a beta test fashion. We have a biobank uh, that can handle 32 million samples at the Mayo Clinic. Just the beta test has now enrolled 42,000 people, which is larger than most studies we've ever tried to do, and that's just the test. But pay attention in the next week. You're going to be hearing a lot more about this, and I hope everybody in this room will decide to sign up. This is going to be a platform for teaching us things about how to stay healthy, because 
This isn't just about disease. This is about wellness as well. What about diet? What about exercise? What about all those other health behaviors that we need to incorporate? This is not just a genomics project. This is a holistic approach to try to understand what are the factors that play out in health and disease. In a very diverse population, at least half of the people involved in this will come from traditionally underrepresented groups all over the country, urban as well as rural, uh, and uh, gender, uh, males and females, of course. We're not doing kids until next year, but we will start doing children in the next year. Great, that sounds so exciting. It is. I, can you tell I'm fired <laughs> up about this? I've dreamed of this for 20 <laughs> years, and a lot of people have been dreaming uh, along with me. You've had some pretty big dreams that have turned <laughs> out to be really amazing feats. So, Congressman DeGay, I think one of the things that Francis touches on is that the data that we need isn't just coming out of our health record. It's, it, data lives all around us, and in particular, some of the most pressing challenges facing our country, and if we can put a ma the map up of the current opioid crisis. Yes. The opioid crisis is a case in point for where medicine and public health and economics is playing out all over the country. There's virtually no county in America where the opioid epidemic isn't touching the lives of families every day. When you think about the data in all of us and the focus that we need to have in health to expand well beyond the walls of the traditional healthcare system, and you think about all the work that Congress is doing, what resonates with you in terms of what we can do to improve public health, but use the science and medical research to also address this terrible crisis? Well, uh, Congress is working right now on, on legislation that I hope will be bipartisan legislation in the end. My committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House, just passed a, a tranche of about 59 sort of single-shot bills uh, last week from the Health Subcommittee. We're hoping that we can take this and put it together in a really broad-based um, bill addressed to, uh, uh, designed to address the opioid crisis. And as you say, it cuts across so many disciplines. Uh, we, need mon we need money for the NIH and for the uh, research agencies to, to, be, to, de to develop research both on the, the, ca the physiological causes of opioid addiction and other addictions, but also on development of um, pain medication that's not addictive like opiates. We need public health responses to be able to address the opioid crisis throughout our country. We need to have, um, uh, we need investigation into the whole uh, pill dumping that we've seen in some counties like in West Virginia, which we're working on my subcommittee, the oversight subcommittee. It's really a comprehensive approach. In the Cures Bill, we had $2 billion for opioid um, addiction and treatment in the states. That money is already going out into the states. And in my home state in Colorado, uh, they're already using that. But, you know, it's, that's sort of like putting on, on a, a little Band-Aid on an mm -hmm. arterial... Putting our uh, finger yeah, in the it, dike, exactly. right? And so, so, um, so Congress understands now that we need to have a really deep systemic um, response to it. But, but I, I, I said in the hearing that we had the other day, it's both been too slow and too fast because it took Congress too long, I think, to respond to this, to this ever-growing crisis. But then when they did, they sort of just jumped up and did this scattershot approach. So I'm working with uh, people on both sides of the aisle in the House and in the Senate to try to really put together comprehensive legislation. I think the appetite is there. Yeah. Great. You know, with either the opioid crisis or all of us, I, I reflect on the fact that both of these things can be, only be successful if we can really engage the minds of, of, of individual Americans mm -hmm. and help them understand the importance of being part of medical research in the future. Mm -hmm. you know, it, we still face single-digit participation in medical research. Mm -hmm. Where, what do we need in order to really engage the public to see that we, it really is all of us that's going to drive the cures for the future? When, one thing, when, when, when we poll uh, Americans, a fa vast majority say they're willing to provide their personal medical information for medical research. One thing we have to make sure as we're encouraging them to do that 
is we also provide them the privacy protection that in, in their personal medical information that they need to have. And certain, certain um, crises like the recent Facebook right. uh, crisis and others make people a little uncertain about putting their medical information into a broad government data bank. I know Francis has ideas how to yeah. fix that. Yeah. Again, I think having this year-long experience with beta testing all of us has been quite informative <clears throat> because that included, with those testers, uh, the opportunity for them to decide whether they thought this was something they were comfortable with or not, including making the electronic health records available. Interestingly, about half of the people that were approached agreed to take part. And I half said, no, I don't think this is for me. But the ones that agreed to take part knew that this was going to be a revealing of what's in their medical records. They also knew we were going to have the most impressive end-to-end -end encryption and security protection that is possible in the current time, but that nothing in the current era could be said to be absolutely fail-safe, given all of the things that we know about that can happen. And yet they were willing to say, yes, we want to take part in this. We want to do this for altruistic reasons because we think this will help the nation and maybe our children and grandchildren. But they're also getting data back on themselves, which is right. different than many projects that have been run in the past. They will find out everything we know about them. It goes back to them, including their complete genome sequence if they want to look at it. And maybe they can explain to us what it means because there's still going to be a <laughs> bit of a challenge in interpretation there. And interestingly, when we looked at different groups, because again, we're focused on diversity, that roughly 50% acceptance was true of all groups. That included right. groups that traditionally have been somewhat less supportive of the goals Almost of research. Almost indicating there's something very fundamental something happening. different here. Right? And I think a lot of it is the way in which Eric Dishman and, and Dara Richardson-Heron, who've been designing the participation part of this, have made it clear that we are not asking people to be passive. They're not subjects. They are full partners. They help us design what exactly this study is going to measure and who gets to look at the results. So they're in integrated, they're involved. They own this project as yep. opposed to having it imposed upon them. That really resonates because if we as individuals feel like that you're just not offering the data up to some random cloud, but you're actually getting something back and it's being driven by your needs, yeah. You know, I reflect on that and I think to myself, we, we have an opportunity of really changing the conversation with Americans and all of us to, to not look at medical research as something that you're gonna need when you're sick, but something that we all collectively are obligated to really contribute to. Mm -hmm. if, if you think about the way we used to do clinical trials, before we had the ability to aggregate data, before we had the ability to do large randomized trials, uh, where you would have a researcher at UCLA and a researcher at the University of Colorado and somebody else somewhere else in their own silos trying to recruit the patients for their clinical trials, trying to then get a large enough sample size, trying to do all this and then maybe trying to coordinate later on versus, versus the incredible opportunities we have now with technology and with what we tried to build on with 21st Century Cures, it really, I think it can be a very exciting era for biomedical research because we can undertake uh, large ran randomized trials. We can do all kinds of research that we couldn't have done even a decade ago. And this is one thing Fred and I really tried to to, to foster when we worked, and we worked closely with the agencies, Dr. Collins and the FDA, and, 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 and it was really to, to be able to take advantage of so many exciting advances that we've had and do this work. Well, when you think about the U.S. and the leadership we're taking on all of us, and you consider all of the various countries, whether it's Israel or China, that are also doing the same thing, at the end of the day, our biology connects us across borders. Mm -hmm. Francis, you know, ending, in ending this part of our session, what is our role in the U.S. in being a coordinator for how we get that type of participation to drive the collective goal that helps patients everywhere? Well, the good news is that science has been international for as long as I've been involved. Certainly the Genome Project uh, was a good example involving six countries, 20 laboratories, 2,400 people, I had the pleasure and sometimes the challenge of being the field general to organize all of this, mm -hmm. but there was never any question that we should do this together. 
Since then, what we've done uh, with human variation, the HapMap project, that was international. The microbiome project, that's international. The cancer genomics project, that's international. We just had a meeting a month ago inviting the principal investigators of other projects like all of us that are around the world, and the UK is uh, a very good example of that, but also China, uh, also other countries in Europe, even some things going on in South Africa and in South America. Together, there's like 18 million participants already signed up in programs like this. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could bring those projects together and agree how we could live up to certain data standards and share data and do meta-analyses? That's what we are going to do. So, and again, the U.S., I think we're in a good position to sort of raise our hand and say, hey, let's get together and talk about this. That's gone well in the past. It should go well in the future. But we celebrate the fact that this is something that's international in scope, and we just want to learn as much as we can from that. That's great. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Collins and Congresswoman DeGette. Thanks. Thanks. Sure Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> what a great way to start off our morning. So I'd like to invite our next panel to join us. Last week, the World Bank closed the largest increase in capital since 2010, and the bank is set to increase its annual lending to $8 billion from $59 billion in the year ending in 2017. American individuals, estates, foundations, and corporations contributed to an estimated $390 billion to U.S. charities in 2016, according to Giving USA 2017. But meanwhile, the financial screws are tightening all over government around the world, creating vacuums that provide that private donors and others can fill. I'd like to invite the next panel on the stage. Dr. Jim Kim, who is the president of the World Bank, has led the World Bank since 2012. He set the goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030 and boosted shared prosperity among the poorest 40 percent of the developing world. Dr. Kim, you're a physician and anthropologist. You've devoted your entire career to improving the lives of the poor. And this might be the stuff of legends, but you smuggled TB drugs into Haiti when you were with Partners in Health, and you marched on Washington over 40 years ago to, to close to down close the, the World, World Bank. Bank. <laughs> yeah. The irony of it all. Uh Dr. Raj, Raj Shaw is president of the Rockefeller Foundation, whose mission has been unchanged since 1913. The mission of the Rockefeller Foundation is to promote the well-being of humanity throughout the world. Raj is a former USAID administrator under President Obama. You are also the founder of Latitude Capital, a private equity firm focused on power and infrastructure projects in Asia and Africa. You're the Chief Scientist and Undersecretary for Research, Education, Economics and in, at the United States Department of Agriculture. And then our Chairman of the Milken Institute, Mike Milken, who probably, deserves, probably needs no introduction. Mike has been a visionary in access to capital, <laughs> medical research, and the public health. You're a renowned philanthropist and the founder of Faster Cures. <laughs> You referred to by Fortune magazine in 2004 as the man who changed medicine. So I want to begin with you, Dr. Kim. Last year when you were with us here at Global Conference, you talked a little bit about a project called the Human Capital Project. And you were joking that it might actually get you fired. So I'm glad to see that you haven't been fired. Tell us a little bit. Where are you with the Human Capital Project? Well, it still might happen because we haven't launched the ranking yet. But um, <laughs> uh, we're, uh, um, you know, it, it was, um, it was a realization. I had been a, an advocate for more donations and, and more interest in global health for most of my adult life, and we succeeded. I and mean, you know, Francis knows this story well. I mean, now there's tens of billions of dollars every year going into global health. But then we noticed something out in the world, and I travel you know, constantly to developing countries, and what, what really struck me was that global health and global education had become very supply-driven um, industries, if you will. In other words, many poor countries were saying, well, if you give us the money, we'll spend it, but if not, we won't. Because what we really want to do is spend on hard infrastructure. We need to spend on roads and railways and industrial parks. Right? And so uh, we literally had a middle-income country uh, minister of uh, finance say, uh, we, you know, we asked him, why don't you pay for vaccines or why don't you pay for medical care? And uh, he literally said to us, well, I know if I wait long enough, the donors will give us the money for it, so I'm just going to wait. And so the situation is that 
that uh, there is a human capital crisis in developing countries. We see several uh, things happening. One is that um, uh, people's aspirations are going up. By 2025, everyone in the world will have access to broadband, many people say. I don't know exactly what the date is. So everyone's not going to own a smartphone, but they're going to have access to smartphones. And what happens is people's aspirations go up. You know, literally everyone in the world will have middle-class aspirations soon enough. And then uh, uh, the, the technology is going to change the nature of work. And you're not going to have uh, as many low-skilled jobs in these developing countries as before. So if you've been stunted as a child, malnourished as a child, if you had poor education, what are you going to do in the economy of the future? And so we, we have to shift the mentality fundamentally from one that waits for donations. And we have to shift it in another way, that so much of global health was about celebrating the generosity of donors. But if we, if we stick with that model, many, many, many people will find themselves undereducated and, and, and without the skills to be able to compete in the economy of the future. And so many countries are going to go down the path of fragility, conflict, violence, and then, of course, extremism and migration. That's going to happen if we don't change the mindset, and the mindset has to change first and foremost among leaders and ministers of finance. So we are going to rank countries from 1 to 180. My colleague and uh, classmate, actually Chris Murray, is here. We know so much more about health outcomes, thanks to Chris's work, and so much more about educational outcomes than we ever did before, that when we started doing regressions with economic growth looking backward, we found among the strongest connections to economic growth we've ever seen. In other words, the great economists like Amartya Sen were right that investing early in health and education is the key to economic growth. It's probably the key to avoiding the natural resources curse, probably the key to uh, avoiding the middle income trap. And, and we've got to make that clear. And the only thing that does that, we have found, is if you rank countries, right? Because we write papers and papers and papers, and people still wait for the donations. If you rank the countries and, and it causes an outcry in the country, then heads of state and ministers of finance have to react. And when I do that, that's when I might get fired. So, Dr. Kim, you, you write in Foreign Affairs, March, and this just past March, that this index ranking human capital in countries will be hard to ignore and it can help galvanize much more and more effective investment. So in addition to the countries that you're going to rank, who do you believe is the most important audience for this index to really reach? Well, I, I hope it reaches every citizen. And I hope every citizen uh, begins to demand uh, more and better expenditures on health and education. Because you know, what we're laying out is, if you have, uh, in, you know, in South Asia, Indonesia has 37% childhood stunting, uh, India, 38%, Pakistan, 45%. It's very likely, and we have a lot of good data on how stunted children learn and earn in the future. We have that at the bank. It's very likely that that percentage of your workers of the future are not going to be able to compete in the economy of the future. And so what I hope is that citizens get riled up, start, you know, start uh, demanding that their leaders in, invest more in health and education. We now know lots of different ways of improving those outcomes. And so I, I feel this enormous sense of urgency about it because you know, in, in, in a few years, when the manufacturing jobs uh, you know, move back to the developed countries because they're so capital and technology intensive, when uh, you know, agriculture becomes much more capital and technology intensive with fewer manual uh, jobs, you know, we're going to have to face this, uh, the, the, this crisis that so many of the young people are unprepared for that economy. Mike, you've always been a believer in this notion of human capital and economic prosperity. What, what do you believe has been holding us back to this idea of putting that collective motivation around addressing human capital? Waiting for Jim Kim to become head of the World <laughs> Bank was holding us back. Waiting for Jim to be head of the Rockefeller was holding us back. Uh, I just don't think we fully realized, as you look at the world, if we think about AIDS and what occurred with AIDS, with it centered in sub-Saharan Africa and 90% of children born to a mother who had HIV or AIDS had AIDS, just imagine starting your life having HIV or AIDS. And today, more than 90% of those children do not. Just the dramatic change, feeding children, you're asking them to go to school and learn, and we know the most 
valuable part of education is in the first five or six years. Being malnutrition, going to school, it's impossible to learn from that standpoint. We have a real-life example today in Venezuela, a very sad real-life example here of a country that's given up democracy in a sense and given up the free enterprise system, a country that has the largest amount of proven oil reserves in the world, that the production has fallen by 50% because you have workers that are so starved for food they can't even stand or even stand at work today and what the results are. So we can see here that with the work that Jim Kim has done and, and others, that these people around the world are healthy enough to learn. And then we have to make sure they can learn. Uh, I think that is going to change it. What makes me so concerned is that we want to deliver this issue that health is coming. And to some parts of the world, it's coming faster maybe to the United States. Francis knows I've been in this hurry-up mode for a long time. But in 93, we did a study showing 70 to 80 percent of people that had cancer are willing to share their data. And if someone finds out they have cancer, it's okay. So you can protect me, uh, but I don't really care if it can help me, help my family, and help someone else. And so we spent a decade trying to figure out how you can waive HIPAA. Okay, Kenneth, thank you very much. I don't really need it. I'm willing to waive it, but it's hard. And then if you've waived it, can you come back later and say, I want it? So I would say the sharing of data is with us. Just like your bank in Kenya is on your phone, medical and medical technology. So I feel what's delayed it is we needed speed and data storage. Mm -hmm. So computers are a million times faster. The cost of storage is going. It's ubiquitous today. And so we're going to bring health care to the world. And if it's accountable for 50% of economic growth, we can step back and look at South Asia and look at Africa and parts of Latin America and understand what's about to happen. The challenge that I see is we got to get our utility curves correct. And if we looked at the utility curve of the middle class of America, which we are really focused on how it got to where it is versus the utility curve, let's say, of those in Asia. In Asia today, the number one expenditure for the middle class still remains as food at 23%. But supplemental education is the number two expenditure. So the size of your house, what your car looks like, is not nearly as important as the education of your children. And the challenge we have here in the U.S. is the shifting of the utility curve by government incentives to where 50% of all the income in the middle class is going for a house and a car. And so you're, you're house poor when it comes to education of your kids. So I think we're seeing this revolution in health beginning. Leaders like Jim Kim and Rajiv give us such opportunity and Diane DeGant and Francis Collins, but we may have to make sure in this idea, if I've given you health, have I still given you meaning to live and a meaningful life once you have that? And unfortunately, in our century we live in today, it's increasingly required to have an education base with that health. Raj, the Rockefeller Foundation has been doing a tremendous amount of work on this concept of resilience, and not just resilience in individuals, but resilience in communities. When you're, I'm sure you're expecting and excited to see the rankings that are coming out as well on the Human Capital Project. How do you believe your cities and, and the people that you work with are going to respond, and where you, do you believe they're ready to make those investments in human capital? Well, I think it's uh, super important that the rankings come out and do shake things up, although we want Jim to keep his job because <laughs> we need him in that role. Uh, but for decades, uh, Jim and others have advocated for how important it is to consider the human capital stock as a productive part of the theory of development. 
and, uh, and the index will be a practical and quantitative way to force visibility and prioritization on those types of issues. You know, up to 30% of variations in national income on a per capita basis can be explained by variations in human capital. And despite countries getting wealthier, uh, you often don't see, whether it's in India because of malnutrition or Nigeria because of tremendous inequity and challenging governance, you don't see those income gains translating into human development and child health and educational outcomes. So getting this link right is perhaps the most important thing to building a world that is more inclusive and more stable and where people see globalization working for them. The Rockefeller Foundation uh, hopes to contribute by doing our part. We have for more than 100 years focused on the science of public health and medicine. And our next era in that space will be in science-based community health. And I, I would just point out that a dollar invested in community health generates seven to ten dollars in economic value. The reason is what Jim was talking about with human capital. You, the first thing you do when you improve the lives of children, and in fact you save children's <coughs> lives, you reduce child mortality, is families choose to have fewer kids and then families invest more in sending those kids to school and ensuring that they become successful. And that is the natural path of building real human capital. Today, almost six million children around the world will die under the age of five. The vast, vast majority of them in low res resource poor settings and of a handful of relatively simple diseases or complications of being born in an environment where there isn't a skilled attendant and appropriate supplies at the point of birth. In, we've seen countries succeed at solving this problem. Ethiopia, over 25 years, has had a 75% reduction in child and maternal mortality. Rwanda, over 10 years, has had a 70% reduction in child mortality. We've set the goal uh, as part of the sustainable development goals to achieve a significant elimination of preventable child death by 2030, and we think it's possible. And it's possible because, frankly, of what Mike was saying. There's now a science around prevention that we're seeing in the All of Us project uh, that helps us understand how to best solve these challenges. There's a science around nutrition and an understanding that protein, fatty acids, certain parts of the food, uh, of what the food system produces and how people consume food have a lot to do with underlying issues related to child health, and we can address and solve those problems based on that uh, shockingly, it's called new science, although you know, it's, it's pretty, basic, pretty basic stuff. I grew up in a vegetarian household. My mother used to always say, make sure you eat your eggs in the morning because it's nutritious. Uh, and, and now there's studies out demonstrating that in children with multifactorial diarrheal illness, having certain types of uh, protein and micronutrients in their childhood can help them absorb food and nutrition much more effectively. And I, I would just note, in a world where we can use predictive analytics to sort of sell ourselves products before we really even know we want them, we ought to be able to use those types of data systems tied into community health uh, to help a health worker know which household in a village might suffer the next child death. Mm -hmm. And uh, while that might sound futuristic, the truth is, as uh, Jim was mentioning, everyone's going to have access to smartphones and going to be generating data. We already see in China some pretty extraordinary examples of uh, algorithm-based service provided to resource-poor communities that don't have access to medical personnel at the high level that you would have here or even in urban settings there. And ultimately, I think making huge progress in this space is not just important for Western China or parts of India or Rwanda and Ethiopia but also I'm from Detroit. And the truth is, if we're gonna overcome some of the challenges we face in this country about people feeling valued and included, we have to deal with the fact that if you were born in Detroit, your health uh, performance over early years of life is roughly one third of that of a child born uh, in a suburb of Detroit. And that's, that's just not the kind of country we wanna live in, and we're not gonna address those challenges unless we bring all of the data, analytics, and science that has been applied to tertiary medicine deep into community service. You know, the audience here is the, an audience that is it's in the converted, right? We all, probably every single one of us, believe in the investments in medical research or public health. What, 
one of the things I reflect on is that this is, a, this is an issue where the interventions are very well known. The human, the, the human capital index is in many ways about trying to change incentives and motivation. Right. You, the World Bank has done these indexes in the past. You're doing business index. Who are other audiences that aren't the types of people who are in this room that really need to, to understand this? Well, part of it um, is reflected in our media strategy for the Human Capital Index. So uh, we put out a foreign affairs piece because we want that community, uh, the sort of uh, well-educated um, uh, council and foreign relations related group of people, uh, to think about this because this has huge implications, for example, for foreign policy. Right? So uh, in our G20 leaders meetings, uh, especially Chancellor Merkel, but now also President Macron, they're very worried about not investing in, in, um, in productive capacity and human beings in sub-Saharan Africa, because they're saying, gosh, you know, if we thought the Middle East and North Africa migration from the Syrian crisis was bad, you know, if Nigeria or Ethiopia falls apart, it's going uh, it's gonna change in a fundamental way life as we know it in Europe. And so th there is that sort of concern about, well, gee, maybe the, the problems of sub-Saharan Africa are directly related to our own, and so that we did that piece. Uh, Chris and I, Chris Murray and I, are publishing a paper in Nature because we want people to look at the science of it. We need to make the case that investing in human capital is directly related to economic growth, because what we hope is that the ratings agencies will take it into consideration when they're you know, when they're looking at uh, uh, their uh, their analysis of uh, sovereign bonds. Because boy, if your borrowing costs go up overnight because you haven't invested in your people, you will pay attention. Uh, we're also uh, uh, hoping to work with Fortune magazine because what we really want is we want all the investors, we want business leaders to ask questions directly of uh, heads of state and saying, hey, we looked at your, um, your, your ranking in the Human Capital Index and we're really worried about uh, long-term investments in your country in the future. Again, that will get the attention. I don't, I don't mean to, to try to be punishing, of, of leaders in developing countries, but this just has been neglected for way too long. And, and so what we hope is that when they see, when they have the shock, you know, when PISA comes out, there's a shock, and, and uh, uh, there's, it's a little, uh, there's a thing called the PISA shock. People can't believe, uh, certain countries couldn't believe where they sat in the ranking on PISA. We hope that that happens, and then they come to us, and they come to the Rockefeller Foundation, and they come to the Milken Foundation and say, hey, how can we improve these numbers? We're ready to help every single country get better quickly, just because we do know that there are so many different ways that we can, we can improve those rankings. But that, that's the thing that's really got to change. The heads of state and ministers of finance have to feel a huge sense of urgency to invest more in their people. Tanisha, I'd like to stress a couple points here. Uh, that One, we don't have a measuring system that's really looking at what your, quote, human capital ranking would be as you receive more education and as you are healthy. Right. Now, there are different other ways you can look at it. You could look at Facebook today, for example, and Facebook's value is over $20 million per employee. And so it's reflecting in many ways the talent of the engineers and large number of software engineers they've hired. Macy's is about 100,000 employees, and it's pretty hard to compete when the market is valuing you in that way. We don't look at the human capital going up when a child is healthy. Right. Okay, so if we, if we could think about that, and people would attack that as you're putting an economic unit on a life that is precious and priceless every life. But in a sense... What you're paying a person is a function of their knowledge and their talent. So many great companies, countries, the world changed because their CEO passed away, got a life-threatening disease. And to think that that company is the same the next day. One of the great companies in the history of the world, Sony, led by Morita, who in many ways was the Steve Jobs of his day. And if you think back over time, almost every great thing that was coming out of Sony, his ideas on women before they gave birth, listening to classical music that would have effect, but the Walkman, the Trinitron, you pay 20% more to buy a Sony product. Industrial design, it was cool. 
but he retired, was in ill health, and passed away. And because of that dramatic change, Sony really, for more than a generation, never captured what he had. So we can see it often. You can see it in sports, maybe more than anything else. Well, is the player healthy or is the player not going to be able to play? But we don't see that and measure that in a child. We put up a slide earlier where Aji was talking, showing that in lower-income countries, in the last 27 years, average life expectancy has increased by 12 years. Well, let's go back to all of evolution. In four million years of evolution leading up to 1900, life expectancy went from 20 to 31. Four million years. And in lower income countries, due to reducing infant mortality but applying modern medical know how, we have a 12 year increase in 27 years. And it's not just the increase. It's that they're healthier. The quality of life is better. And I think the challenge that Jim and Rajiv have given us on this panel is that, okay, you're now going to be healthier. You're now going to be stronger. You're going to have maybe more access to education. But what are your opportunities going to be? Yeah. And if there's two billion or three billion more people in 2100 living in Africa and they don't have opportunities, they're going to be living someplace else. Right. Right. And they might not be productive members of society, which is why in a world in transition, I'm giving an advertisement now, <laughs> our final panel on Wednesday afternoon is really addressing this issue. Okay, what are these opportunities? And so I think... This ranking is so important. The Milken Institute puts out plenty of rankings, and you know if you rank someone low, they're going to be telling you you have no idea what you're doing and coming to see you. And if you rank them high, <clears throat> they're going to put it on the front page of the newspaper, your ranking. But <clears throat> it does cause a change of behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a clear roadmap that those countries that invest in the health of their people and the education of their people, that the world is coming to them mm -hmm. where a higher percentage of the world's output is digitized and you can employ anyone anywhere around the world. And so, Jim, I, I think <clears throat> we um, praise you in your efforts, your courage, and we look forward to the protests that began probably starting here in the United States when we yeah. find out where the United States ranks versus many other countries. Well, I think Chris is going to do the subnational studies uh, out of the University <laughs> of gave Washington. gave him the hard job. <laughs> but I mean, I think it'll be very interesting to see how certain counties in the United States compared to countries that have skyrocketed up the ranking like Vietnam. It'll be very interesting to see. Yeah. I, I would just add, doing something about building human capital is not solely a public sector responsibility. Yeah. You, you absolutely Definitely. you need public investment. But if I think about uh, what Mike just said, it, undoubtedly two to three billion people are going to move from two dollars a day in income to ten or twenty dollars a day in per capita income over the next fifteen years. As that transition happens, how they choose to uh, consume food will have a tremendous impact on the health of those populations uh, into the future as life expectancy expands, and if they follow, if we build food systems, commercial food systems, in all of these countries and for these communities that mimic what we've done over the last 50 years in America or the last 70 years in America, you'll have billions of people on highly processed, frankly unhealthy, high sugar, high added fat food products that have long shelf lives and are packaged and prepackaged. And there must be a better way. We know that investments in agricultural research around the world have largely focused on staple grain productivity, <clears throat> and in the United States on corn and soybean in particular, whether it's public or private. We should have, uh, as I know this conference is exploring, real private investment at scale mm -hmm. around alternative sources of protein that are healthier and that are produced more sustainably 
and around food products that have the characteristics we know consumers demand, but are not going to lead to long-term debilitating non-communicable disease that, uh, or chronic disease that costs societies a tremendous portion of their GDP to treat and maintain. Similarly, in health, if we rebuild health systems like we have in the United States over 70 years, right. you know, we're spending still a far too high percentage of every healthcare dollar in the <coughs> last few months of life as opposed to building health, making smart science-based health investments in the prevention space and the community health space and the public health space, particularly for lower income and minority communities. We just can't afford to live in a society that does that. And that is as much about those of you in this room that are leaders in the health and food sectors and agriculture sectors, those of you that are investors in these types of business, and those of you that are technologists that have the ability to use commercial systems and business opportunities to reshape the kind of world we build for the two to three billion people coming up the income curve that Mike just referenced. Absolutely. I, I'm glad I'd just like to weigh in for one second on that. If the World Bank or the Rockefeller Foundation <clears throat> could start ranking food, <laughs> that when you eat this food, the value of your human capital is decreasing. Roger, Roger, <laughs> Roger we can do that. When you eat this, Roger, we'll do that. Yeah. Okay. And one one uh, job losing <laughs> ranking at a time for me. <laughs> <laughs> so what we see <clears throat> in parts of China is more than a hundred percent increase in breast cancer, prostate cancer due to the change in what they're eating. Nigeria today and tremendous escalation incidence of hormone-driven cancers because of the change in physique and diet. And so I think this is a point that's with us, the sequencing of your microbiome and other factors. Absolutely. You will now be able to see what's occurring as you eat things traditionally. We did a study that we launched here, I think, three or four years ago, that if you went to a fast food restaurant and you asked for super sizing your fries, you said, okay, gosh, it's only 25 cents more <laughs> to increase by 50% the amount of French fries. We calculated that it actually cost you $8.56 in healthcare costs <laughs> every time <laughs> you ask for super size. So this is happening. And if if you aren't aware of it, every major consumer products company in the world today, uh, Nestle's with us, PepsiCo's with us, are focused on changing their products, uh, focus on what are the products of the future, and no different than, I think, of technology. Mm -hmm. The explosion of hundreds or thousands of new protein food alternatives uh, are coming down the pike, and, and I think you've made a, a, a key element here. If we're going to get them healthier, if we're going to provide education, we cannot follow the thing that has made the United States the most obese country yeah. in the world. Yeah, right. And just the change of weight in the United States cost the United States $1.5 trillion a year, just the change in weight. But I think other countries are recognizing this. Uh, Mexico, at the end of 2013, put a tax on junk food and soft drinks. But we'll see. Uh, not everyone's going to go to what Japan has done and where you get your waist measured after 40. And if, you have, if a man has over 32 waist, well. you have to undergo nutritional counseling. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Dr. Kim, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about what's in the data, because I think that this brings up, and you raise it in your article around the like, credibility of the data and that people believe right. it. So the great, and, and again, I mentioned Chris again, because Chris has just changed the world in terms of understanding uh, actual health outcomes and then comparing across countries. So we, this is so much better than it was even 10 years ago. Uh, and, and at the bank, we've really focused on educational outcomes. Right. So, uh, you know, one of... Uh, uh, Gary Becker, a great friend of Mike's and someone he's championed for years, talked about the importance of human capital. Robert Barrow and others have, have looked at educational attainment, numbers of years of schooling, and then uh, linked it to economic growth. And that worked for the OECD countries, but not so much for the poor countries. So now that we have so much more testing being done, 
uh, we, we can rank, uh, you know, we hope close to 180 countries uh, in terms of outcomes. Now, we don't have the, you know, perfect data on all the different countries, but enough to know that, for example, uh, a year of schooling in Singapore is worth more than twice of a year of schooling in Malawi or, 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 or Yemen, for example. Mm -hmm. And so we can actually discount the number of uh, years of required schooling, the number of years that you actually have, with what you actually learn during that time. So if you combine uh, what we call learning-adjusted years of schooling with the kinds of health outcomes that, that uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation has, together we feel like we can come up with a very powerful mm. correlation with economic growth. Now, we're still playing with what mm -hmm. is to be included, and that is you know, going through a, a, a peer-reviewed process, but we feel that uh, by the time that we get this peer-reviewed article out, we'll feel really good about saying, as a first shot, at a human capital index, we stand behind this. And so what happens, you know, the doing business ranking has been incredibly useful. There's been more than uh, 3,800 reforms, but the week before the doing business ranking comes out is my busiest week. Because as Mike said, all the countries that are going to come out ranking low call me and complain about the methodology. <laughs> all, the, all the countries that are coming out ahead get ready to prepare their press release, right? So you're going to always right. have that, but what we found is that it's the only thing that actually moves the needle. So that's, we're going to do that. But let me, let me uh, 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 reflect on some, some things that both Raj and, and, and uh, Mike said. You know, one of the biggest problems for us is to rethink the path to economic growth. Right? Because, you know, the, the, the traditional thought, and every, literally every African head of state I talk to says, we're going to follow the Korean path. Mm -hmm. We're going to go from an agricultural society with, with low levels of education. We're going to go to light manufacturing. We're going to go to heavy industry. We're going to go to silicon chips. We're going to go through the whole process. But the fact of the matter is that path is probably closed off to the vast majority of low-income countries. It's just not going to happen. And how do we know that? Well, in, in Bangladesh, from 2002 to 2010, they created 300,000 jobs in the garment industry every year. Last year, they created about 60,000 jobs. And they are buying things called SOBOTs, S-E-W bots, from Germany. And in Bangladesh, uh, the garment, garment uh, factories are being taken over by robots. And, and so much, it, it, you know, the, the, it, it, traditionally, it's been manufacturing that's absorbed low-skill labor. It's been agriculture. But if we, if we don't have that, then what is the path? And so this is a tough question. And, one that um, uh, we're now sitting back and saying, so what are the no-regret uh, investments? We know no matter what happens right. to the global economy, they'll be important. It's probably uh, broadband. It's probably energy and clean energy. And then the other one that we know for sure is human capital investments. So, you know, there's a big, big problem in front of us. What are they going to do to grow? Are they Alibaba models that, that sort of democratize access to capital, give you, you know, up to $150,000 in two seconds if, you, if you've behaved well online? Is that where we're going to go, where it's really roads and broadband and then, you know, ability to, 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 to sell and buy on the internet? Is that, is that what it is? I'm not sure, but boy, we've got we, we, we to gotta find out and we've got to move in those directions quickly. I, I just have three very quick comments that I would make. One, in this very room a year ago, 2017, Masa Sung from SoftBank told us, if we pull up slide six, told us he saw this thing in the paper uh, of a microchip, a microchip a computer on a chip, and he was standing there on the street in Berkeley crying the most unbelievable invention the world had ever created. And I think we need to think about what that is doing and how it has changed the world. And it's changing the world in healthcare, it's going to change the world in education, and it's changing everything. And we if you haven't thought about this enough, now why did more venture capital go into computer science and programming? Because it was easier. It's easier to create apps and education than trying to find the cure for a disease. And so if the world is hooked up, let's go think of some more apps we can give them for education or other things. Disease was a little harder, but with a million-fold increase in power for the same cost, it's going to change. The second is rankings. 
<laughs> so if you were a student at Beverly Hills High in math, people said, boy, Beverly Hills High, they must be pretty good in math here in the United States. <laughs> okay, they rank 87.7%. But what about if we compare them, say, to Canada? Well, in Canada, that same performance gets you in the 46 percentile. And then, as we've heard in Singapore, where does that put you in Singapore? Well, that's 34 percent. So we are misleading our children to believe that you're in the top based on a, a, a sample here that is not a world sample. Third, and my last real point, is young. What have we learned in almost 40 years of philanthropy at the Milken Family Foundation? We know the highest return has come from supporting people that are young. And our lowest return has come from supporting people at the peak of their career. Mm. Go look at who wins a Nobel Prize. Almost all their ideas are within five years of being in school. They might have been 60 when they won it. But the ideas when they were young and, and, and adapting. Andy Grove, who sat on my board for more than a decade, used to tell me every day, the person graduating Stanford today knows far more about physics than he does. He might know how to apply it better, but their knowledge of physics is so different. And David Baltimore, who sat on the founding board of Faster Cures, has had this passion that how important it is. Science is this driving force in our health and prosperity, David said, who won a Nobel Prize at a very young age and former president of Caltech. But the best place to develop science is in elementary school. That love, whether it's bugs, whether it's robots, and we have to instill that in our Singapore schools the two most desired courses starting at six years old are robotics and coding today. It's cool. It's what they want to do. And so this is the promise of our opportunity. And Jim, I, I just couldn't be more excited about the light you're going to shine on this. And, uh, and I say, why hasn't happened before? No one has had the insight. No one's had the courage to create a ranking that tells our government leaders how we should think about building our countries from that standpoint. And Rajiv, I know you might be a little disappointed you're not fully involved with your hedge fund and money management business, but I actually think the world will be better off with you leading the Rockefeller Foundation. Thank you. And with that note, I'd love, for Rajiv, if you want to make the last set of comments. I think that this, it, the ranking is going to stimulate a very vibrant conversation about where do we go from here. And about a year ago, you made some comments at the Global Philanthropy Forum about the idea that there is so much pressure on governments now to pull back on foreign aid, and there isn't enough philanthropic capital that's going to make up the difference. But what is the role, whether it's finance or philanthropy, that could help achieve a collective goal once these governments want to take ownership of the future of their human capital and link it to economic prosperity? Well, I, you know, my experience uh, under the Obama administration running USAID taught me that uh, if you can create a clear path and demonstrate how investments in others around the world, particularly those who, who have materially less to work with than we do. Uh, but if you can demonstrate, especially in the United States, to the American public and its leaders in Congress, that in fact those investments are generating meaningful outcomes for people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're improving the human capital of countries. They're building a global community in which we can trade and prosper and thrive as opposed to uh, be shut in by fear and threat, uh, that in fact, on a bipartisan basis in this country, people are willing to support that mission. That's why America has for more than six decades been the world's leading humanitarian partner around the world. That's why we built the Bretton Woods institutions that Jim now leads. 
Uh, that's why, in fact, uh, we had, even at USAID, uh, Republicans, conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats coming, working across the aisle to hold hands, to increase the level of investment, to increase our capacity to do results-oriented, evidence-based, science-inspired work. And they got there because they all believed that in one way or another, America as an idea is an exceptional one. And it's one that the more we can export those basic ideas of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, perhaps measured in a new, more sophisticated instrument, the Human Capital Index, uh, the stronger we are as a country here at home and the more prosperous and interconnected we can be as a global community. And that, I think, is very much the spirit of this meeting. And uh, I look forward to the index in that context. Good. Thank you. Just one last, one last comment. So, so, you know, um, uh, when, when people ask, so what are you guys really trying to do at the World Bank Group? And I would put it this way, and it reflect, you know, Hiro Mizuno, who's here, of the, of the uh, Japanese government pension fund, uh, said, you know, the GPIF is, is, uh, is a great example of a universal owner. We have such a diverse portfolio in so many different things that our interest is in that the whole world does better together. And so uh, the question that I hope we're asking here is how can we make global market capitalism work for everybody and the planet? How do we do that? And how do we, you know, how do we uh, ensure that people get a good return on their capital, but then in, as they're actually doing it, 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 it improves the likelihood that we're not going to have whole you know, uh, swaths of people who have no role and no, no hope in the global economy. I would argue we can do it. And, and Mike, I want to thank you for inviting us here because we feel that it's this group of people, the 25 trillion or so under management in this group, that can actually make that happen. Right. Well, there's 25 trillion, that's their own <clears throat> money. The managers have 45 trillion to help okay. you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but who's but, counting? Yeah. I set my sights higher then. <laughs> yeah. I just want to respond to something Rajiv said. Declaration of Independence today, if we were writing it today. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and what we can offer you also is a right to good health. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.